Hi everyone, and welcome to CE Elevated, a CSU Vet CE webinar series. I'm your host, Clara Go from Colorado State University, and I'd like to thank you for joining us on behalf of CSU Vet CE here at the Translational Medicine Institute. We've named this webinar series CE Elevated, symbolic of our mountainous Colorado terrain, as well as our mission to provide you with an elevated CE experience in all that we do. We believe that there is great power in the collision between inspired learners, engaged educators, and meaningful experiences. Tonight, we're sincerely thankful for the support of Mavora, who has made this webinar episode possible. Tonight, you are all in for a treat as we are joined by a great mentor and friend, our very own Dr. Ross Palmer. Dr. Palmer is a board certified orthopedic surgeon whose career has spanned both private practice and academia. He owned a mobile surgical specialty practice in the Monterey Bay region of California and had the opportunity to work in many different general practices at that time. Here at CSU, he's a professor of orthopedic surgery and is the director of education in our Translational Medicine Institute. Ross has recently served as president of the Veterinary Orthopedic Society and has been named an honored mentor by the American College of Veterinary Surgeons and speaker of the year at the VMX in Orlando. He's lectured and taught hands-on laboratories all around the world. And tonight he's with us to share with us his perspectives on how fracture fixation training can help you save the limbs and lives of some of your patients. So without further delay, I'll turn the session over to Dr. Palmer. Well, thank you, Dr. Go, And I'm gonna do my best to share my screen with everybody. I have to say that it is a uh, tremendous pleasure and honor for me to be on this side of the microphone this evening. I'm usually doing the moderating, and so uh, tonight I get the treat of teaching with all of you. And, and the goal is to talk about how fracture fixation training can actually help you to save the limbs and lives of some of your patients. I want to start off by really emphasizing that there's a lot of very good reasons to amputate a limb. So that's not really here to be disputed. Um, there are those cases where in order to really preserve the best quality of life for a patient that an amputation makes sense. And the same holds true for helping some of our patients to end their best life with dignity and honor. Um, through the means of humane euthanasia. And so that's not really what I'm here to debate. But what I am here to talk about is that there are some bad reasons to have to amputate a limb um, or worse, to have to euthanize a pet. And so we're all dealt with these fractures that in the back of our mind, we know they're very treatable. And, and for many of us in many parts of the world, but not all parts of the world, there's a, a reflex that says, I'll, I'll just refer it. But depending upon where you are in the world, that may not be available to you. And, and even in the US, there's this pre-conceived you know, notion by some folks that, that uh, referral is always an option and it really isn't. And when we look at veterinary medicine as compared to human medicine, it would be unthinkable in the human field to have to amputate a limb or to euthanize a human patient for some of these very, very treatable injuries. And this finally kind of hit me over the head like with a hammer some years ago when I finally realized how much of a concern this is and how much this is the experience of so many primary care veterinarians. And that came about when I issued a pre-course survey to the attendees of one of our fracture treatment courses. And I asked them in this survey this question, state briefly what has motivated you to register for this fracture fixation treatment course? And what I expected to receive, and I did receive some responses that said things like, I've always liked orthopedics, so I wanted to learn more, and that makes sense. But, but what really hit me over the head was these sorts of responses, and they, they really were for me somewhat shocking. But in the last year, I've probably amputated 10 legs that I know that I could learn to save. Um, 
That same year, one of the respondents said, when a surgical referral isn't in the cards, I feel like I've been quitting on my clients. Those are some of my very toughest conversations. And I think we can all relate to how difficult it is to be in that position when you'd really love to be able to help, but you just don't feel like you can, and you feel like you're letting your client down. Um, another comment was, look, I know there's some fractures that are way above me, but there's also a lot that aren't. That's what I'm taking this course for. And so in the US, um, for some of you who are earlier in your career, you may have assumed that specialty referral was always there, and it really wasn't. And you may likewise be assuming that, that gosh, we've been plating fractures for hundreds of years, but we haven't. So to make me into a dinosaur, I, I started my career in the mid 80s. Bone plating wasn't really even a thing till about 10 years before I started my career. Um, and so bone plating hasn't been around that long. Referral to a veterinary specialty center really didn't start in motion till we got to the mid 80s. And even until the mid 90s, referral in the US was restricted primarily to universities and very large metropolitan areas. What I've seen happen in the US over my career is there's been this gradual shift from a very pragmatic agrarian view of our pets to a more emotional value of our pets as family members. What I mean to say is in the 1970s, you simply could ask an owner, did you want this dog or do you want a dog? And the answer for many people at that time was, I just want a dog. I, I need a dog around the ranch. I, I'd love having dogs around, but there wasn't this emotional connection to this dog. And I think as we all recognize, that's very different for many of our clients, not only in the US, but around the world, is people are becoming much more attached to their pets. And within the US, that is, I don't know whether it's led to the specialty center boom or the specialty center boom has led to that. I don't know how that is, but, but there's really been a, 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 special, uh, a boom in specialization over the, the, you know, since about the year 2000. Now, that said, there is still a reality of there are barriers to referral. And those can be financial barriers, which is the cost of care at some of the specialty referral centers. And sometimes that's added to the cost of, of lost revenues. When I'm taking my dog two days to get to a specialist, I'm also losing you know, my own income, et cetera. And then there's those geographic barriers of depending upon where you are in the world and where you are in the US, there's different degrees of ge geographic barriers between you and a veterinary specialty center. So I think we've all seen that situation where you could look at any of these four cases and say, all right, what would I do if I'm presented with this case? And I think many of you have been presented with cases just like this, but referral isn't an option. Then what are you going to do? And so really i'm going to share just very briefly a few cases with you that are from some of my heroes in primary care veterinary medicine and so um you know these are cases that were presented and the veterinarian i know very well and he recommended referral and for one barrier reason or another that wasn't an option and so here in that first case that i showed you of a very distal diaphyseal to metaphyseal uh, radius ulna fracture he applied bone plating and it was a very good solution, not only for getting the bone to heal, but to restore function and comfort and quality of life for that patient. Um, here's another example of a short oblique fracture of the tibia, again, using a plate pin combination and the pin was probably used more as a, an alignment guide to just help hold things in alignment while the bone plate was added. It's not doing a lot mechanically, um, but was just part of, of probably the fixation process. Here's a little bit more classical sort of plate rod application. And, and when we look at the day one radiographs, we can see that um, 
there was a problem there, right? That distal most screw isn't where the veterinarian wanted the screw. And so the veterinarian said, okay, I, I see that and I can make corrections and did a revision to remove that screw and then apply, applied another screw proximal to um, the screws that were there in the immediate post-operative films. Again, this dog went on not only to heal, but to have a very high quality of life, good comfort and function in the limb. And so, you know, we can look at things, we could say, gosh, was, was it done perfectly? Well, I'll show you some of my cases later as well. And, and, you know, none of us are perfect in our application, but I really do hold these cases out because in my mind, this veterinarian really is a hero because is able to take a dog who otherwise would fall in this gap between the, you know the availability of a specialist and not and and would end up having that limb amputated or in some cases worse ending up with euthanasia um, for for a reason that really actually can be managed in a primary care setting so what what i hope you're getting from just that introductory set of remarks is that anybody can learn to save the limbs and save the lives of some of their patients. And that's what we're kind of here to talk about this evening and what we address in some of our courses. So when we talk about fracture treatment skill sets, there's a variety of skill sets, and this isn't even an exhaustive list by any uh, stretch of the imagination, but we have coaptation skills, there's pen and wire skills, external fixators, I could include interlocking nails as well, um, plates and screws, et cetera. And within each of those columns, there's actually a collection of skills that we would need to learn. And so within coaptation, you know, the most basic skills might be those first aid skills for managing an open wound, because many of these injuries also are associated with open wounds. And it might be over the fracture itself, such that it's an open fracture, but it could be an open wound somewhere else in the body. And we have to learn to be able to manage those wounds um, appropriately. And then as we advance in our coaptation skills, we learn how to apply bandages and splints really as a first aid sort of a mobilization where we know there's going to be a few days until this patient can receive the surgical fixation that's required, but it's best for the patient to have their limb bandages, uh, bandaged or splint in the meantime. And so we learn how to uh, acquire those skills well. And then probably the next level in terms of our coaptation skills is, is learning sort of definitive treatment of selected fractures. It's certainly not suitable for all fractures, but selected fractures can be def treated definitively with splints or casts. And so there's a skill set of how do we manage to get the fracture adequately reduced, what constitutes adequate reduction, and then how do we maintain that reduction while we're applying our splint or our cast. When we think of pins and wire, most of us automatically think about intramedullary pins and full surclage wire, as is illustrated here for a long oblique fracture of the femur. But we should also be thinking about tension band wiring fixation of fractures that occur at muscle tendon units. And so here it's depicting a greater trochanteric fracture, but this same sort of fixation technique is very simple but very robust for application to fractures like the tibial tuberosity, olecranon, etc. And so again, within the use of pin and wires, there's a, there's a gradation of skill sets working from the top to the bottom within that column. Pen and tension band wiring is relatively easy to learn. Surclage wire, we always have to remind ourselves of the principles, but there's actually some fairly nuanced skill sets in applying the surclage wire well um, uh, so that it works to our benefit rather than to the patient's detriment. And then we learn to combine surclage wire with intramedullary pinning. And the skills that we learn in intramedullary pinning can be used also for using pins as an adjunct to external fixators, bone plates. They come in handy when we're learning to use interlocking nails, et cetera.
When we talk about external fixators, it's no coincidence that I started with a tibial illustration. We oftentimes say that the tibia is God's gift to external skeletal fixation. It's uh, without question the easiest bone with which to apply an X-fix or an external fixator. One of the advantages of the external fixator is it can be applied relatively biologically. And so we can learn in a primary care setting to apply an external fixator in a closed fashion, or the next best thing would be what we call an open but do not touch approach, which is a relatively biologic way of approaching the fracture and manipulating the fracture without disrupting the fracture hematoma and the, and the vascular and muscular attachments to the cortical fragments. But as I said, we, we typically start by training people how to apply fixers to the tibia and then maybe progress to radius ulna, then maybe femur and humerus, um, and then ultimately we can learn to apply them for limb deformity correction. When it comes to bone plates and screws, we typically start people out with diaphyseal fractures where you have a relatively large proximal main bone segment and a relatively large distal main bone segment. And from there, we can progress to juxta articular fractures. Those are fractures that begin to approach joint lines. They're, they're closer to the joint. And then ultimately, we begin to address articular fractures. We're going to talk later in this session about reducible versus non-reducible fractures um, and, and the judgment uh, that has to take place in terms of our uh, treatment priorities. We kind of progress on to pelvic fractures and then probably one of the last things we learn in the world of plating is this minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis or so-called MEPO. For years, I think the mental sort of approach has been you get good at splinting and then you learn pen and wire and then you learn external fixators and then you learn bone plating and I I guess I would question that uh, wisdom I think it really does depend a lot on what sort of fracture caseload do you see because there's a lot of fractures that we see that to be very honest we can't adequately treat with coaptation or pins and wire and some not with external fixators. So I don't believe we need to necessarily think of working from left to right along this slide in terms of the skills that we acquire. If we focus on bone plating, I think there's a lot of confusion that comes from the different terms that we throw around, and that's because we sometimes use interchangeably descriptors of the use and function of a plate versus the design of a plate versus the trade name, etc. And so when we look at a bone plate that is used to compress a transverse fracture or a transverse osteotomy for that matter, we can use that plate so as to create compression between the proximal main segment and the distal main segment. And that use of the plate then allows us to call that a compression plate because that's its function. That's how we're using it. We could actually take that very same plate and in a different scenario, such as shown here, we might have a three-piece fracture with a single large butterfly fragment that can be anatomically reduced perfectly and maintained in that position with cerclage wire or in this case with lag screws. And then the bone plate is applied and it's not compressing the fracture. It's not holding the ends apart. It's just neutralizing. It's holding everything right where it is. And so we call that bone plate a neutralization plate. We can take a very similar plate and we can say, gosh, what about that instance where we can't reconstruct all of those little pieces? And we're going to talk more about that in the next part of uh, this evening's discussion. But in this case, we're bridging that fracture zone, all of those cortical pieces that have not been reconstructed and they have muscular attachments to keep them viable. In this case, we're bridging all of that and we call this plate a bridge plate. And lo and behold, it could be the same piece of metal that we're pulling out of our set. In one instance, we use it as a compression plate. In another scenario, we use it as a neutralization plate. And in another scenario, we're using that very same plate as a, uh, a bridging plate. Now, conventionally, when we insert screws in a plate, it squishes 
the bone plate down against the bony surface to create friction between the bone plate. That's bone plating as we know it conventionally. But many of you have probably heard about locked plating, and you may know about it, but you may not know fully about it, or maybe you're wondering a little bit. And the way a locked plate is different is watch how this screw goes in, is what actually will happen is the threads that are in the head of the screw itself, so it's in the screw head, lock or engage in recipient threads within the hole of the bone plate. So it doesn't compress the bone plate against the surface at all. The mechanism isn't based upon friction. The mechanism is based upon that lock of the screw head to the bone plate. So even though it looks very similar to a conventional bone plate, it actually functions quite differently. And then, you know, Synthes was kind of the first to market, at least in North America and much of Europe. Um, and so there's a variety of trade names of Synthes plates that you may have heard over the years. Uh, DCP and LCDCP and LCP, but those are all just trade names. And similarly, you've heard of um, things like the SOP or string of pearls plate that has been commercialized by Orthomed, or you may heard of the Fixin system commercialized by Intrauma, or the Alps plating system by Keon, now owned by Muvora, uh, or the PAX system by Securos, but those are all just trade names, and so I don't want anybody to be confused by that. So, Clara, this is probably a good time to pause and see if any questions have come up before we move into the second phase of our presentation. Thanks, Dr. Palmer. Um, we actually have quite a good sort of comment question. Um, you're right. When I was in vet school, I really didn't think there would be the need for me to do surgical fracture fixation because I thought I'd be able to refer all those cases. But when referral isn't an option, I find myself amputating more limbs than I'd like um, because I don't have plates and I'm not trained to use them. But should I get comfortable with iron pins and circlage wiring before thinking about learning to apply bone plates? Yeah, I'm, that's a great question. Um, and it does a couple of things. It kind of reinforces some of what we're talking about. But um, as well, it it is that... Um, that kind of old thinking of, and this was my mindset for years and years and years of, I've got to learn to use pin and wire before I learn to use a bone plate. Well, I, I guess the fallacy of that thinking is if what your common caseload is transverse fractures, you're never going to get any experience with pin and cerclage because that's not a good fixation modality to treat that fracture. So I do think one of the things that, that we'll talk about is is the importance of looking at the cases that you see in your practice to determine what sort of fixation modalities does it make sense for you to learn. Um, as I mentioned, there's you know all kinds of different fixation modalities. They all have their strengths and weaknesses. And, and uh, you, like myself, we have skills with multiples of them. But I think, again, lots of times in a general practice setting, Veterinarians are challenged by, I, I got to have one system or two systems that's going to work for the majority of the cases that I see. And I think bone plating does fill that, that purpose oftentimes. Great question. Another one which um, I've heard pretty often as well is, 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 it, is it realistic to think that I'll be able to handle all my own fracture cases if I take a bone plating course? Mm, I, I, yeah, it's a, a great one. Yeah, no, it isn't. And, and that's actually going to be a good segue to our second set of, of uh, uh, or second part of this presentation. No, you won't be able to treat them all. It really is a pathway where you, you learn techniques that are applicable to cases you're going to be successful with. And as you gain experience with those cases, then you can begin to add to that new techniques and, and new training. And I guess the way we look at bone plating courses is rather than a one and done course, start with basic bone plating and then progress to, you know, progressively more advanced levels of bone plating. So like this year, then coming up, we have, uh, we have a basic 
uh, fracture treatment course with bone plating. And then later in the year, we have an advanced course. I think we have another basic course as well. Um, in future years, we're actually going to have multiple levels of bone plating courses, just so you can build your skills over time. It's a great question. Um, and then maybe lastly, uh, there's so many different plating systems, as you kind of had mentioned, sizes of plates, types of plates, etc. cetera. Um, it seems so daunting. Where would I even start? Yeah. Yeah. And, I, you know, that's always one of the things that is sort of confusing or daunting is a good word. Um, you know, I think probably two things to do. Um, one is, is, you know, look at your caseload and, and you can begin to determine what, what do I most commonly see? What bones do I most commonly see? What sizes of dogs do I most commonly see? What are some of my most common fracture patterns, et cetera? You don't have to treat every single fracture. What we're saying is start small, save a few limbs next year, save a few lives next year, and then over time, you'll be able to save more and more. So, so one step is look at, look at your caseload. Another is, you know, if you take a course, it is amazing how when you get your hands on the equipment, all of a sudden, all these things that do seem overwhelming and daunting become simplified. You're just much more comfortable with it when you've just had somebody just kind of helping you down that pathway to learn to use the systems, then it's a little less overwhelming. Wonderful. Um, again, we're grateful to Mavora for sponsoring this webinar and Q&A session. And uh, with that, maybe I'll hand it back to you, Dr. Palmer. All right. Well, thank you. Those are good questions. Let's see. All right. So let me back up there. So some of you, you know, and I remember being this way it, it, it is you're like, you got to be kidding me. I'm not I'm not orthopedist material. Um, Keep in mind, nobody, not even Clara Go, was born an orthopedist, right? Nobody was born an orthopedist. Instead, what you do is, is you get supportive and friendly help to kind of train you, not only the skill sets, but to become familiar with these systems. And then a big part of high quality training as well is is cherry picking the winners, learning what are the cases in which you're going to have success. And that's actually a good segue for this session because we're going to talk about how to identify the cases where they're, they're good for learning. So let's, let's take a step back and make orthopedics simplified. And, and one is to say, okay, um, if you want to get a fracture to heal, there really are just two conditions that you have to satisfy. And so maybe there at home be thinking about, hmm, what are those two conditions? I think the first one, what most people would automatically jump to because of the way we've been trained is, well, the fracture has to be stable. That's the mechanical condition. And that's true. It does have to be stable. But it, it has to be more than that. So what's the other condition that you have to satisfy? But it also has to be viable. So there's a biologic requirement. All the stability in the world won't get it done. All the viability in the world won't get it done. It's that balance. It's having the right mix of both of those. But then if you satisfy those two conditions, you will. You'll win every time. You get these fractures to heal. You restore limb function, comfort, quality of life. And it isn't so much that the right answer was an external fixator or the right answer was a bone plate. There may well have been a lot of right answers for a given case. It's just those things that will satisfy those two conditions that, that um, are required to get it to heal. <clears throat> So we, we really do, as orthopedists, we wear two different hats. We wear the hat of a carpenter who's trying to get something mechanically stable, and we also wear the hat of the gardener who's trying to keep the fracture zone viable and nourishing those cortical fragments of bone so that we can get it to heal. And sometimes in our zeal to get something stable, we start to compromise the viability. So it's important to always keep this duality of roles in balance with one another. 
One of the ways that we do that is we say the first step in your approach to treating a fracture is to classify it. And, and every fracture can essentially be classified as one of two different types. The first is a reconstructible fracture or what some people refer to as a reducible fracture. And the other is a non-reconstructable or a non-reducible fracture. And it's critical that we be able to identify these and classify these because there's different treatment strategies that are applied to each classification. So let's dig a little bit deeper into that. So a reconstructable fracture or a reducible fracture is, it's a simple fracture. It's a two-piece fracture or maybe a three-piece fracture with a single large cortical butterfly fragment. Very simplistically, I look at it as a children's puzzle. Um, it's, it's so obvious. The pieces are big. You know right where they go. You can hold them in that position. Those are reconstructable fractures. And when we see those fractures, we apply the treatment strategy of anatomic reduction. Let's put it together like a perfect puzzle and rigid stability. But I think we all recognize that that isn't what a lot of our fractures look like. But for those that do look like that, that's a good treatment strategy. And so this is one of my cases where it was a long oblique fracture of the proximal tibia. I anatomically reduced it. I used cortical bone screws in lag fashion to compress those two main fracture segments together. But I recognize that those lag screws by themselves won't be able to stand up to the load that this dog would apply to the limb. So I needed to, to support that with a bone plate. And so this is one of those bone plates applied as a neutralization plate. Now, again, would I do this one differently today? I, I would. That bone plate, I would actually have much more uh, length to that plate if I was going to use it as a neutralization plate. But nonetheless, um, it makes the point of how we treat reconstructable fractures. How about non-reconstructable or non-reducible fractures? Well, this is where we see multiple fragments, especially small fragments. And so if, if the former one you think of as a kid's puzzle, this you think of as a Humpty Dumpty sort of fracture. So some of you may know the nursery rhyme for little kids um, that says Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. So Humpty Dumpty is this egg, right? Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. So why should we try? So when you see a Humpty Dumpty fracture with lots of little fragments, you know that all the king's horses and all the king's men can't put it together, neither can you, and so you shouldn't try. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to preserve, we're going to shift our strategies to preserving the biologic healing potential, preserve that fracture hematoma, preserve that muscular attachment to those small cortical fragments. Restore spatial alignment. This means the proximal main segment and the distal main segment are aligned similarly such that the right leg is now of equal length to the left leg. And the paw of this fractured limb is pointing, you know, the toes of the paw are pointing in the same direction as the nose of the dog. So toes uh, and nose pointing in the same direction. So it's, it's worrying about the alignment of the joints it's not worrying about the apposition of the little fragments. We don't really care. And instead then, in terms of our application of our device, we apply a fixation that is capable of the mechanical demands of what we would call a non-load sharing fixation. In the bone plating world, that is that bridging plate that we talked about before, where you're holding everything out to length and you're not worrying about all of those little cortical fragments in the fracture zone. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole conspiracy theory of Humpty Dumpty being pushed. Let's not go there. But if we can do these strategies for a non-reconstructable fracture, once again, it doesn't matter what device we use. If we accomplish the goals, we properly identify the fracture as non-reconstructable and we apply the appropriate treatment strategies, we can expect that we can not only get the bone to heal, but we can restore patient function.
The other thing that we do is we form something called a fracture case assessment score. And so this is actually, it sounds kind of daunting, but it's actually quite simple. So we know that there's a variety of things that influence whether a bone will heal. One of the conditions we said we had to satisfy was mechanical stability. So there's probably some mechanical factors we need to be thinking about in terms of formulating our treatment plan. So what are those mechanical factors? Well, there's also probably some biological factors that we better think about that are gonna be important in our fracture treatment planning. So we need to be thinking about, hmm, what are some of those important biologic factors? And I've added in a third as well, and th these are the clinical factors. So we're working with human beings as owners, we're working with animals as patients. There's gonna be compliance issues. We might as well just face that. And so we wanna factor some of those compliance issues into our fracture treatment planning. So we, we essentially devise a scale, one to 10, and we have arbitrarily decided that a 10 is the good news end of the scale and a one is the bad news end of the scale. And now we're just gonna look at each of those mechanical, biological, and clinical factors. So the mechanical factors that we should talk about are listed here. And so how unstable is the fracture zone? What kind of load sharing should we anticipate? Is this going to be the ideal load sharing of a transverse fracture, like a compression plate sort of scenario? Or is it gonna be a non-load sharing scenario like a, a bridging plate? Patient size, amount of limb dysfunction, et cetera. So let's kind of go through this a little bit step by step. So here we have an incomplete or green stick fracture of the tibia in a young dog. And notice that the fibula is even intact. So when you palpate this limb under anesthesia, you actually don't even detect instability. So it's very, very mild instability. Whatever we do to treat this case, the fixation isn't going to have to do a whole lot of work. This is another case that I remember. This is a complete fracture of the radius. Uh, I'm not sure from these radiographs. You can see on the craniocaudal view that there is a fracture of the ulna. Is it complete? Is it not complete? I don't know for sure. But what I do know is when I palpated this limb, it wasn't floppy unstable. There was obviously a fracture there. I could move it, um, you know, pro curvatum, rec curvatum, so front to back, I could move it. I could bend it side to side, varus valgus, but it wasn't terribly unstable, so I'll call it moderate instability. And of course, this kind of fracture where we all look at it, we say, oh God, that's sick. Um, whatever you do to that fracture is going to have to do a lot of mechanical work. That's very bad news from a mechanical perspective. Load sharing is essentially this idea that when an animal is bearing weight on their limb, the ground is pushing up on their foot through their limb and that load is transmitted from their foot up towards their torso. And if we have a transverse fracture, that transverse fracture, if it's compressed end to end, the bone actually transmits some of that load right across the bone. So this is the compression plating scenario we've talked about. That's ideal load sharing. Some of the load is going through the implant, but some is going through the bone. The load is being shared. Somewhere in the middle would be a case like this where we've got cerclage wires anatomically reducing things, and then we have a fixator applied or a bone plate applied in a neutralization fashion. Again, that's somewhere in between in terms of load sharing. And then we've talked about this sort of scenario where you have lots of little pieces, and when we see lots of little pieces, we have to resist the urge. Don't try to reconstruct it. Remember, this is a non reconstructable fracture. This is Humpty Dumpty. Don't try to put the pieces together again. Instead, bridge the proximal segment to the distal segment, but recognize that your implant system is going to be doing a lot of work initially until this fracture begins to consolidate. So that's a challenge for the implant system. It's bad news mechanically, but as long as we take it into account with our fracture treatment plan, we can compensate for that challenge. The size of the patient obviously determines how much load is placed upon the repair. And then the amount of dysfunctional limbs. So 
as an example, if, if we've previously amputated a limb and now a dog fractures uh, one of the remaining limbs, chances are he doesn't have a good way to off-weight that limb. And so that puts a lot more mechanical demand upon our repair. Similarly, if it's a polytrauma sort of situation where we have, this is the radiographic appearance, appearance of one pelvic limb, but that's the radiographic appearance of another pelvic limb, um, that, that's going to uh, apply an awful lot of demand upon our uh, stabilization of those fractures. And we have to know that that's bad news from a mechanical perspective. And we should just take that into account with our treatment planning. How about clinical factors? Well, we need to be thinking about the compliance of both the human or the owner as well as the animal or the patient. Regardless, neither animals nor people are perfect. Um, we have a tendency when things go wrong to blame it either on the poorly compliant pet or the poorly compliant owner. And in reality, we probably should anticipate that we're not going to have perfect compliance. I mean, certainly we need to instruct the owner about things that ought to be done. But part of our responsibility as well is to kind of psych it out a little bit to understand how likely is that to happen? Is this, is this an owner who is willing and able to do the follow-up and they're able to restrict the activity? Or is this an owner who in reality, their life is so crazy, no matter what their intentions are, we know that chances are they're not going to be able to do what we ask. And so it, it, isn't a, it isn't a popularity contest. It isn't do they make a pretty family photo. It's what is their lifestyle like? And so here you see a, a lovely family, but they could have an absolutely chaotic life. And so we ask this guy and he says, yeah, I know we look lovely, but we're so busy paying for this car. To be honest, I'm so busy, I'm not even sure those are my children. The wife points out, where's the dog? Um, so it, it isn't what kind of car do they drive? Are they wealthy? Do they have financial means? It, it really is a matter of what are they going to be able to do in the convalescent period? And that really should be part of our kind of assessment of, of the case. Same for the patient. Um, some patients are very tolerant of activity restriction. They're easy to treat. They're calm. You know, others less so. And then there's the super dogs of this world um, who you can put them in a crate if you want, but they're going to do 17 miles within that crate. And so we just have to look at the patient's temperament and anticipate what kind of compliance are we really going to receive rate it on this one to 10 scale and use that in our fracture treatment planning. We also need to be thinking about the dog's temperament. So for an example, with an external fixator that I know I'm going to have to do some bandage changes and cleaning of pin tracks, um, maybe that's not my choice for this particular dog. And now let's move into the biologic factors. And so we know that we need to preserve the viability of the fracture zone. And so we ought to be thinking about some of the characteristics, not only of the fracture zone, but also the systemic health of the patient. So let's kind of take those one at a time. So let's go back to this scenario. We have that green stick fracture. Well, mechanically, that was great news, wasn't it? But it's also great news biologically because this is a fracture pattern that doesn't require a lot of energy to create it. And, and you kind of know that because when you look at the soft tissues, there's not a lot of soft tissue swelling. There's not a lot of bruising. So this is not only an inherently stable fracture, it's inherently biologically a very healthy fracture. And when we get to patient factors, we'll also realize it's in a young dog. So this is, this is a really nice scenario. Um, the far extreme is the case I showed you before, is any of one of us would look at that and say, ooh, that one has taken a really severe hit as an open fracture. It's going to take a long time before those cortical segments of bone um, are vascularized. That's going to be a very delayed healing. That's not good news from a biologic perspective. And then we think about the health of the patient. And one of the most obvious is the age of the patient. So, you know, this cute little kitten um, who I think I've got a little periosteal elevator there to show you how tiny this kitten is. Um, uh, 
you know, not only is it not going to put a whole lot of load upon its fracture repair, but it's, it's a young, healthy little kitten. And so in a matter of weeks, if not in a matter of days, that fracture is going to heal. But it might be very different from this elderly patient, particularly if there's some systemic illness um, or cachexia or something of that nature associated with, uh, with the, the patient. So we take all of those things and don't get overly detailed, but we, we basically look at the factors and we say, okay, from a mechanical perspective, where on the scale do they fall? Are they down on the bad news end of the spectrum? Are they in the middle? Are they up in that upper third somewhere? And then we basically assign a number. And whether, whether you decide it's a nine or you decide it's a seven, it probably doesn't matter. You're, you're up in that upper third of the scale. You just know mechanically this dog's in pretty good shape. And then you psych out the compliance of the owner as well as the patient. And in this case, we've got good news. Um, we said we're not going to assign a 10 because we're not expecting perfection. But, but, you know, this is, in this particular case, maybe we've got reason to anticipate very good owner and patient compliance. So we give them a 7. And then we look at some of the biologic factors. And again, we, we look at all of them and maybe we decide it's an 8. And I don't get out a calculator or anything else. I mean, in this one, it's pretty easy to average them in your head. You say, well, that's, that's an eight, right? Um, but, but it, you know, it, it isn't a, a, a mathematical calculation. It's, again, just an overall observation. And we take that total fracture case assessment score and we begin to learn some things from it that are relevant to us as the new learner. So these cases that have a higher fracture, ca fracture case assessment score, these are much more routine. These are the great cases for building surgical experience. So if you're new to fracture repair, these are great cases to start with. Or likewise, if I'm learning a new technique, I've been doing fracture repair for a long time, but if somebody's handed me a new technique, I'm, I'm going to tend to apply it on these higher fracture case assessment scores. Why is that? Well, because with those sorts of scores, technical errors, judgment errors often are tolerated. The patient makes up for our human imperfections. Um, complications and revisions are less common. Now, that's in contrast to those that score very lowly. So if you went through the whole scoring system and you came up with a two, well, that isn't the case I would suggest. That one I would push really, really hard for referral. And if it isn't an option, then, then amputation sometimes does make the most sense. I mean, that, it's not as if amputation is always a bad um, choice for trauma. And, and oftentimes what I will do is I will actually use this tool and I will just basically, I won't go through all the details, but I'll talk to a client and I'll say, we rate them one to 10. 10 is the best news in the world. One is not so good news. Your dog rated a two. And so what that means is he's gonna be very intolerant of any errors that I may make. He's going to be very prone, even if I don't make a single error, he's going to be very prone to having complication or the need for revision. So I can really only give you an estimate for what this surgery is going to cost, but I have to tell you up front, my radar says there could be the need for revision procedures. So it actually can be a very good client education tool. And then it also tells me that that balancing of my carpenter versus gardener role is really, really important. So I go back and I look at that fracture case and assessment score, and I may see, hey, his biologic score is actually reasonably high. It's his mechanical score that's so low. So I'm going to really have to emphasize my carpenter role on this case because that's where he's deficient. So those are all things that we talk about in our courses. So I guess what I want to reassure you with in all of this is, is you've got this. I mean, we can help you. And I've, I've kind of oversimplified with this equation of 1 equals 2 plus 1. What the heck does that mean? But essentially what I'm trying to appeal to you is that if you'll take one training course on fracture repair, in your first year of a using that technique, that could probably help you to save two limbs and maybe one life. 
And then as you progress down that pathway, each year you will progressively save more limbs and more lives. And it's, it's a pathway that you're basically stepping down. So my take home points are fractures do happen. Um, I do by no means want to negate the value of referral. I'm merely recognizing that it isn't always feasible. And when it's not feasible, as was in those surveys of, of my course, um, you can learn to be there for your clients and your patients when it matters most. So that you don't have to have those difficult conversations. And that fracture treatment, again, nobody was born an orthopedist. It's a pathway. You know, you'll start early in your experience treating those cases that, that score maybe eight, nine, or 10. And then as you get a little bit more comfortable, you'll develop skills that help you deal with a six or a seven. And then you'll gradually work your way to more and more challenging cases. And that's a process, so give yourself some credit. And with that, if there's any more questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you, Dr. Palmer. So many great points about, you know, those fractured decisions we make every day and um, how to cherry pick those, those uh, good, good cases for um, when, we're, when we're starting to learn a new technique. Um, we really appreciate your willingness to contribute to the CE Elevated webinar series as well. And also a very special thanks to Mavora as our sponsor for this webinar episode. Um, Dr. Palmer and colleagues will be leading a number of hands-on training courses for principles of fracture repair and also advanced fracture repair here at the CSU Translational Medicine Institute in June and September, which happen to be both beautiful times of year here in Fort Collins. And we invite you to check those out at csuvetce.com. Next month, we'll learn about tips and tricks for shortening your equine arthroscopy learning curve. Doctors Laurie Goodrich and Brad Nelson will be presenting that particular episode on Tuesday, May 3rd at 7 p.m. New York time, and that's 5 p.m. here in the mountains. We look forward to seeing you then. Once again, thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. And in the meantime, remember you're more than a learner, you're a whole person. Take care of yourself and let's look out for each other. Good night. Mm -hmm.